Hi, I'm Talia Baroncelli, and you're watching the analysis.news. This is part two of my discussion with economist Bob Polin on the causes of inflation. If you enjoy our work and would like to support us, you can go to our website, theanalysis.news, hit the donate button at the top right corner of the screen, and make sure you're on our mailing list. That way, every time we publish new content, we can send it straight to your inbox. You can like and subscribe to the show on YouTube or on other podcast streaming services such as Apple or Spotify. See you in a bit for part two with Bob Poland. I'm very happy to be joined by Professor Bob Poland. He's an economist and professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he's the co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute, or PERI. He served as consultant to the Department of Energy during the first Obama administration, and he also advised Bernie Sanders, as well as progressive Democrat Pramila Jayapal, on their Medicare for All policies. Co-authored the book Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal with Noam Chomsky. So thanks so much for joining us again, Bob. It's great to have you. Very happy to be on. Thank you, Talia. Well, now that we're talking about history, I mean, how much of the current petrodollar system that we have comes from the 1970s? Because you have, you know, the global economy essentially is tied to the reserve currency of the U.S. dollar, and you have 89% of global transactions executed in U.S. dollars. So when Republicans talk about, oh, China owns the debt, China owns the U.S. debt, and that could, you know, I guess, undercut the entire global economy. What do you say to that? And I was just thinking recently about, you know, Republican Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House in the 90s and 95. He said, we can't possibly raise the debt ceiling and, you know, all this fear mongering around China owning the debt. I mean, what is your how do you weigh in on that? So uh, most of it, or maybe all of it, is complete nonsense. Um, China owns about 2% of U.S. debt, meaning China does not own 98% of U.S. debt. I mean, they do own some, and they uh, use their holdings of U.S. debt to try to, to yes, to support their own trade policies. Uh, they try to keep the value of their currency the yuan, low, so that the products they want to sell in the U.S. are relatively cheap. If the value of their currency relative to the dollar were to go up, then the things that they try to sell, whatever they may be, you know, what you can get in Walmart uh, or computer programs or or um, solar panels, the price would go up. So China does strategically utilize their holdings of U.S. debt, but they do not hold most of the U.S. debt. So none of that, uh, you know, whatever happens with China's holdings of U.S. debt will not have a significant impact on the overall management of U.S. debt. And and more generally, what we think about, what are the factors that we should care about when considering U.S. debt? Well, U.S. government um, forecasts, when you look at the fiscal year of 2024, shows that publicly owned debt is somewhere around 29 trillion U.S. dollars. And um, I think the entire debt, or correct me if I'm wrong, is 36 trillion U.S. dollars. So what does that mean? And is that a high number? Is that something to actually be worried about? Like when the fiscal conservatives say that the debt is too high, is that is that significant in any way, or is it just a numbers game? Yes, it is. Well, it's it's significant in, in a couple of ways, obvious ways. One is that it's, you know, first of all, you can't just say the number. You have to scale it to something. What makes it big? So the thing that, that's one way to scale it in a relevant way is, what is it as a share of the overall GDP? And so the... Um, the the debt held outside the U.S. government, as you said, about twenty-eight trillion, is roughly equal to GDP. So it's a hundred percent of GDP, and that has gone up sharply. And before the Great Recession of two thousand seven, two thousand and nine, U.S. 
debt as a share of GDP was in the range of 40%. So it's gone up from 40% to 100%. Now, why is that? Is that something we should really, really be worried about? The, the still more useful way to scale it and to think about its importance is how much are we actually paying in interest on this debt? That's where it, you know the rubber hits the road, really, because that's what how much goes out every year, and that's money that you know could be spent on education, healthcare, environmental protection, and instead is going into the pockets of the U.S. government's creditors. Now uh, that ratio, uh, the U.S. Int- the payment on interest of the U.S. government debt prior to COVID was about 2% of GDP. So not nothing, but uh, not a serious matter. I mean, by comparison, at the end of the uh, Ronald Reagan Bush one uh, regime of the 12 years, the U.S. government interest payments as a share of, of, of uh, total GDP was 5%. So it's two and a half times higher. And you did not hear Republicans, you did not hear Newt Gingrich said, oh, my God, this is a disaster. Uh, they paid it because, you know, you could pay it. It, it did squeeze the government budget, but it, it didn't collapse anything. And, you know, prior to COVID, we were at 2%. So, and the reason we were at this low level was because interest rates were low. You know, you can borrow a, a billion dollars, and if you, uh, the interest rate is zero, Guess how much you pay in interest? You pay zero. So the real important variable here is how, what the interest rate is. Now, because interest rates went up uh, post-COVID because of the Fed's attempt to, you know, to control inflation by raising unemployment, weakening bargaining power of workers, now we pay about 3.5% of GDP in interest. So that's... That's an increase. That's something to be concerned about. It is not anything that is going to cause an immediate collapse. It does mean that we have to pay more in interest. Uh, you know, we're paying about 14% of government budget goes to cover interest payments. That's money, again, that could be spent on useful things. Um, and so that, that that is the real concern. And if, if we are concerned, it is not in any kind of immediate crisis. The, the global financial system is not about to collapse. The U.S. government bond remains the safest and most desired asset in the entire uh, global financial system. So all of that is true. But at the same time, if you, if you really want to cut back on how much the government is spending in interest payments, well, then raise taxes on rich people. I mean, Trump did the opposite. Trump lowered taxes on rich people and is promising to do more. Um, and that's what causes the debt to go up above and beyond what happens as a result of uh, a recession. Right. Trump increased military expenditure as well as cut taxes on the rich. So that will obviously uh, decrease the amount of revenue that the U.S. government then... And that's what that was what Reagan's formula was also. So Reagan did that in a world in which you also had very high interest rates, much higher than today. Uh, and that's why U.S. government interest payments were up at 5%, more than you know two and a half times what they are now as a share of GDP. But just going back to the numbers, I mean, we were saying that something like $36 trillion is the amount that the U.S. has in debt, and around seven of it is seven trillion of it is held by the government, and then twenty eight point two or so trillion is held by the public. But who is the public in that figure? I mean, are these like rich people who then have offshore accounts, or is is this money that's also invested in in real estate? Or can you explain what that debt actually is? Sure. Um, so yeah, so we take out the share that is held by the Federal Reserve itself and other federal government agencies. So that gets us down to 28, as you said, 28 trillion. Um, The uh, state and local governments in the United States also 
um, they are holding um, about 13% of all the debt. Why, why do they hold that? Well, again, U.S. government bonds are the world's safest asset. So if you have money that you want to park and you want to earn some interest, you're not going to spend it or you want it as a reserve fund, you can do it in all sorts of ways. You can invest in real estate. You can invest in, you know, in, uh, in you know, artificial intelligence, whatever. But the safest way is to just own gov U.S. government bonds. And that's why most entities in the world, not just the U.S., want to hold U.S. government bonds. So that's that gets us, if we talk about the U.S. government and then state and local governments, we're now at about one third of all the of all the U.S. government outstanding debt. And what about the other two thirds? Okay, the other two thirds, you know, other countries are going to hold about ten percent. So China's at two percent. The country that holds the most is Japan. Um, so other countries, and then the rest, yes, are owned by banks. Uh, investors, all kinds of investment companies, because it's like, okay, it's like having a bank account, because if you hold U.S. government bonds, you have to you get cash, you can sell that really quickly. And the, the value of the U.S. government bonds is not going to fluctuate, so it's a safe asset. And, it's, you know, not, you know, uh, non-wealthy people also hold U.S. government bonds in the U.S. and all over the world. I mean, the government of Luxembourg, government of Luxembourg, holds the fourth most U.S. government debt than any other country. They have a lot of banks there as well, don't they? Yeah. And they're livers of, of EU, I think, central bank policy. And I mean, Luxembourg plays a, it's a small country, but plays a huge role in determining European uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Yeah, I mean, the irony during the, you know, the global financial crisis, 2007, 2009, and then again during the COVID crisis, um, when the U.S. economy was in bad shape, the world economy was in bad shape, um, rather than there being a flight away from U.S. government debt because you think, oh, the government, U.S. government's in bad shape, they're borrowing, their economy's in bad shape, there was actually uh, a flight towards uh, that investors of all sorts wanted to hold you more U.S. government bonds because they're safer. They're safer than holding stocks. They're safer than you know holding real estate investments that were tanking. They're safer than investing in artificial intelligence or tech firms. And my guess is that's going to stay that way for some time to come. I wanted to talk about the campaigns right now between the Democrats and the Republicans, because if you look at both of the debates, so the one that was the disastrous one between Trump and Biden, and then the subsequent one between Trump and Harris, um, I think in both debates, the moderators referred to government spending. And there was a report written by the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, which was published, I believe, in I think it was January, February. And then there was an updated version of it in, in June. And I'll just read two of the numbers there. So according to this report, President Trump approved $8.4 trillion of new 10-year borrowing during his full term in office, or $4.8 trillion excluding the CARES Act and other COVID relief. And President Biden, in his first three terms and five months in office, approved $4.3 trillion of new 10-year borrowing, or $2.2 trillion excluding the American Rescue Plan. Um, so just looking at that, if we're to trust these numbers, Trump spent heck of a lot more. So why do the, the Republicans keep saying that it was the Biden-Harris administration that racked up the debt? Because they, they just say it. Uh, why not say anything? There's nothing else that there's, that's being overlooked in this report. There's no, no, I don't know. I mean, you know, as I said, re really there's two ways that government debt expands. One is when there's a recession and so then tax revenues go down and then Generally, governments try to expand their debt finance spending to prevent the economy from collapsing. That happened under Trump and it happened under Biden around the COVID issue. When Trump expanded government spending, it was more geared towards rich people and business. 
when Biden did it, it was more geared towards giving money to the middle class and low income people. But in both cases, you had this expansion. Uh, and then the other way, you know, independent of what happens when you have a recession, is when you spend more and you cut taxes. And so under Trump, um, you expand the military spending and then you cut taxes on rich people. So that generated uh, an increase in the debt that uh, has carried over because we haven't been able to, you know, reverse those tax cuts. Well, last time you were also speaking about the um, supermarkets and price gouging and, and collusion within certain industries that leads towards monopolization and jacking up prices. And there was um, a merger which was prevented by an antitrust case, and it was preventing the merger of two really big companies in the supermarket industry, um, Kroger's and Albertsons. And I think what's really interesting here, and this uh, goes back to inflation, is that if you look at the U.S. economy or, or, or the United States in general, there are four really big companies that uh, account for half of grocery purchases, and that's Walmart, Kroger, Costco, and Albertson. Um, so this merging or potential merging between two of these big companies, Kroger's and, and, and Albertson's, would point towards massive consolidation in that sector. And so the reason I, I bring this up is to ask you the question of the price of eggs, because we saw the price of eggs go up incredibly over the past few years. So would you say that the rises in the price of eggs is because of a lot of the, the monopolization in the food sector and the wholesale food sector? or But then how does that account for, you know, local farmers who are local producers? You know, they're not importing eggs from China or from Europe. So I, I would assume that oil prices don't play into that. I mean, how do you explain that? Well, first of all, just let's say in general, inflation in the U.S. is basically negligible at this point. As, and, and that's true for the other high-income advanced economies. You know, I just checked uh, to make sure I have the numbers right. Inflation in the last month was uh, 2.3%. Let me make sure I've got 2.4% from September 2024 to September 2023. So that's basically in line with the Fed's 2% inflation target. So right now, over the past year, inflation in general is negligible. That, that does not mean that there aren't individual prices that are going up sharply, because when we say overall inflation, that's this basket, so-called average consumer basket. That, that price has gone up 2.4%. Now, eggs. So eggs uh, went up. Uh, yes, so eggs um, at the, uh, during the COVID, during the depths of the COVID, uh, a dozen eggs on average was $1.41. Um, uh, by the end of COVID um, and then past that, um, Eggs went up to four dollars and eighty-two cents for a dozen. Now eggs are at three dollars and twenty cents on average. I just checked all these numbers. So what? So this is clearly beyond the COVID lockdown and the the pressures, the supply side pressures that I was talking about that were generating the the initial COVID, uh, the post-COVID price spikes. We're we're in a totally different situation. So how do we explain this? Well, um, two factors have been important. One is the spread of avian flu. And um, we it, just in the U.S. itself, we've lost about 20 million hens um, over the last year. So that has created a supply shortage. So we're back to the idea of a supply shortage. And now what has happened with this supply shortage, um, comparable to what we saw after COVID, was that uh, uh, monopolistic companies or oligopolistic companies take advantage of the supply shortage and jack up prices uh, rapidly and to the extremes that we're observing. And so that, you know, take the one important case, the so-called um, Cal Maine Foods, which controls about 20% of all the market, of the wholesale market for um 
egg supply in the United States, CalMain Foods uh, increased their profits over the last year by 600% because they were able to mark up the prices in conjunction with the oligopolistic firm. And interestingly, um, CalMain Foods does not report a single instance of avian flu at any of their uh, supply location. They didn't experience any losses, at least not that are being reported. Nevertheless, they took advantage of the uh, supply contraction of eggs, hens, um, to jack up prices. So that's this, you know, the term that's uh, emerged as so-called greedflation. Um, greedflation uh, reflects this idea of companies that have market power, that have oligopolistic power, jacking up prices in the face of supply shortages, taking advantage of these supply shortages to the maximum extent. No, it was all when the term came, you know, kind of emerged like two years ago, right after COVID, uh, that, you know, saying companies are really greedy and that's why we've got price increases. So other economists were saying, well, that's ridiculous because companies are always greedy. So they're, what's the big deal? What's new here? That they're more greedy? Well, of course. No, they're not more greedy. It's just that the conditions have changed that allow them to exercise, to uh, bask in their greed more than they otherwise would be able to. Right. I think some of the internal documents that were shared in this particular antitrust case to prevent the merger of um, Kroger's and Albertson showed um, that, you know, there were, as you mentioned as well, like there were increases, you know, inflation, for example, or supply chain, uh, supply chain issues, and they took advantage of that to then increase their own prices. And then when the when inflation or when those supply chain issues were no longer an issue and prices went down, they didn't pass on those savings to consumers. They just kept their own prices up. So I think in this particular case, Kroger's kept the prices up, even though Walmart was reducing the prices. So that's an indication of, of that company taking advantage of the situation. Um, but what would your response be to controlling that? I mean, would it be nationalizing the wholesale sector? Or, I mean, how would you prevent companies from engaging in, in that sort of price gouging? So, I mean... You know, short of, uh, you know, nationalizing, I mean, in, in many instances I have called, I've supported nationalization of the fossil fuel industry, for example, and realizing that that ain't happening. So it ain't happening with uh, the the grocery uh, chains either. So what is is there any kind of policy mechanism that could be uh, effective here? And I think there are fairly effective antitrust laws in place, um, meaning antitrust laws, meaning anti-monopoly practices. And so that uh, when there is evidence of companies doing exactly what we've seen happen with uh, Kroger's, Albertson, uh, with CalMain, which controls 20% of the wholesale uh, egg market, um, then you have to... Um, introduce measures to limit their pricing power. That's what that's what this is. And we do have at present, you know, Federal Trade Commission that it is trying to uh, utilize the laws that are on the books. And that's the head of the uh, Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan, who is, as you know, as policymakers go with some power, I think she's really been effective and committed around these issues. Not surprisingly, uh, she is being, you know, vilified. And one of the big demands of, you know, the billionaire Democrats supporting Harris is, well, we like you, Harris, a lot better than Trump in general, but, you know, you really got to get rid of Lena Khan. Yeah, Reid Hoffman has been saying that as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just one final question, a quick one, if you can sum up what you would say if you were a presidential candidate, what if you were in Harris's shoes, for example, what would you be saying right now with regards to price gouging or other measures to entice the American consumer to get them on your side? Like, what should 
Harris be talking about right now to convince people that she will be the best on the economy? Well, I don't know how much people want to hear like the true story of the economy, uh, but let's start with that. And the true story is as things go, uh, especially for working people, low income people, the economy is performing pretty well. Over the last year, uh, you know, over t- uh, the full year 2023, uh, average real incomes after controlling for inflation went up by 4%. It's the first time since 2019. And average incomes for the lowest 10% of the population went up by 6.7%. So in real dollars, you know, uh, it's definitely not the world that I would love to see, but um, we have seen at least modest steps towards a uh, more prosperous and more egalitarian economy. And I do give Biden some credit for that. So that's step one. Step two, okay, yes, people are really concerned about prices. Generally, price inflation has stopped. Um there are these particular pockets, eggs being the big one. And the egg one is all about monopoly uh, power being exerted. And that therefore, what uh, Harris should say is, we're going to continue to enforce, to use the laws that are on the books and to prevent this kind of excessive price markups. Meanwhile, more generally, we're also going to continue what uh, again, I give Biden credit for. He's ex- for, you know he said that he is pro union. Generally, he has he has been pro union. He's he you know made sure that the dock workers strike ended and the dock workers got sixty percent raise. Um, these are positive steps. They didn't come from Biden. Biden was a mainstream neoliberal Democrat. They came from organizing efforts over years and decades. It filtered up to the you know highest levels of the Democratic Party, such that the story coming out of Biden is a very different story that came out of Clinton. But if I can push back a bit, because over the past few years, you keep hearing the Biden administration saying we have the greatest, or the U.S. has the greatest economy in the world. We you know we've created the most amount of jobs, but people were clearly suffering, or they were upset or frustrated. I mean, disapproval ratings or incredibly high. And I think part of the issue now is that Harris has not been able to distance herself from Biden. And so people are are wondering what she's actually going to do. And she hasn't really substantiated that all that much or to the degree that she maybe should in in order to convince people. So, I mean, you sound a bit more optimistic. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, look, we we've been talking about we talking about neoliberalism, neoliberalism, which has prevailed for 50 years almost was a you know a variant of capitalism that was aggressively pro rich pro big business anti worker and the democrats supported it as well as the republicans broadly speaking um so biden has cut into it not dramatically but he has cut into it and you know in 3 years and you know he he was under the uh, COVID lockdown. Um, so there's, you know, the the notion that you could reverse all that in a matter of two years is, of course, unrealistic. So, um, but if you continued something akin to what Biden did with respect to supporting, in general, not always, but in general, supporting uh, unions, Supporting uh, workers and the you know the National Labor Relations Board, which oversees um, union management negotiations, has been very much on the side of workers as you know the opposite as of Trump. Those things, you know, if you had fifty years of that, we'd have a different society. Three years of it um, is just the beginning, and so what we need to do is continue in the trajectory that was started under Biden, but we have a long way to go. All right, Bob Pollan, it's been really great speaking to you. And hopefully next time we can ask you about 
this paper you've been working on on fossil fuel subsidies. I look forward to it. All right. And thank you for watching TheAnalysis.News. Feel free to go to our website, TheAnalysis.News, and support us if you can. Thanks for watching.